Hello, everybody. We're talking about how measuring your figure drawings is a mistake. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Now, measuring the figure is really common. It's a system that's taught all across YouTube. Probably the person who really pushed it I would say is Andrew Loomis and his quintessential figure drawing book, Figure Drawing for All It's Worth. But the thing is, we're gonna tell you guys the opposite, which is we think it's a big mistake. My theory is that people measure the figure because they want assurance that, oh, my drawing's correct. What do you think, Kat? I totally see why people would want assurance. Drawing the human figure is scary. <laughs> Drawing anything correctly is scary. But when we seek the correct answer, we're lim limiting ourselves to only one answer. And the answer is that humans don't come in one shape and form. Human comes in Humans come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And measuring everyone is just not possible. That's the easy way out. It is a cop out, in fact. Tell us in the chat who here has experience measuring your figure drawings. Are you still doing it? Did you stop? Did you come back? I'd love to hear from your experience. Because I really think every artist should ask themselves at one point, why is it important to you for your figure drawing to be, quote, correct. Do you care about your figure drawing being correct, Kat? To a certain extent, yeah, because I'm afraid that people will say, oh, she doesn't know what she's doing when looking at my figure drawings. Of course, I do want them to be exact and correct. But I also have to set myself up for the possibility that sometimes I'm not going to get it right. Sometimes things change. Sometimes things are different. Sometimes people come in a different size than I'm used to drawing. I'm totally different. I could care less. <laughs> I'm like, uh, whatever. And I know people want to feel like their drawing is believable, but that's not the same thing as correct and accurate. Because if we're talking about the whole world of people, there's no correct. I suppose you could say, well, I'm drawing Ken. I want it to look like Ken. That I suppose you could say is accurate. But Kat, some of my favorite drawings are not even close. Like Peter Paul Rubens, <laughs> this is like cottage cheese on his back, but I love it. It's really expressive. It's such a strange drawing. It just makes you think the person who drew this must be an interesting person too. And oftentimes drawings that are very expressive or dynamic, they tend to focus more on those qualities than think it's two millimeters off. We need to, I mean, I can't draw like that. For me, all those numbers are incredibly stressful. So maybe it's just me wimping out on the measuring, but I just feel like it is severely limiting. I mean, I love these Diane Victor drawings. They're incredibly expressive. I know some people will say, yeah, but this isn't in a classroom, but it doesn't really matter in my opinion. This is a mindset that people get into regardless of the context. So speaking about context, measuring the figure does not work in every context. For example, can you measure a two minute pose? No, you're struggling to even get a figure down regardless of whether it's correct or not. <laughs> or even five minute pose. A five minute pose, you'd be surprised how fast that time passes. I mean, everybody has to do the art prof timed figure drawings and creature drawings because you'll learn pretty quick that you have to train your eye in order to draw these things. It's impossible to measure. Or another context that doesn't work if you're drawing a group of figures. This is something I did on a live stream. The figures are overlapping. They're all different poses. And Kat, what was this drawing you did? This was a drawing I did in your class, Clara, when you taught me when I was a sophomore. <laughs> and basically the prompt was claustrophobia. My take on it was just multiplying the human body by many times into 
the head of the claustrophobic mindset of this person. And I had to be able to draw and overlap different kinds of bodies and different kinds of sizes of bodies. As you can see, the bodies in the head are not the same size as the body outside. So how was I supposed to measure that accurately? And do I really care about measurements? <laughs> When I look at this, I'm just thinking, oh man, I'm so glad that's not me. That looks horrible. Actually, during that critique, Clara, you weren't even focused on the figures at all. You were focused on the fact that it didn't seem claustrophobic enough. I remember this critique. <laughs> you see, just distract your audience, get them to think about something else other than the measuring. Again, if you have two figures that are interacting, you've got limbs overlapping, any measurement, it just goes right out the window. Now we do have some comments here. Seven Angelic says there is a usefulness to measuring the exact face you're drawing in terms of how big is their nose in relation to their eyes. Do you usually measure portraits, Kat? I never do. I don't measure them, but I do compare and contrast. I usually have one landmark in the face that I focus in on, like maybe uh, the jaw or maybe the temple, something that will not move, such as the bony landmarks in the face, and then compare and contrast everything based on that. But that's actually training your eye. You're looking at one thing and comparing it to another thing, and you're looking at the differences and the distance between these things. Well, when I was in graduate school, we were doing portrait sculptures. They would give us calipers and we had to measure everything on the face with our sculpture to make sure it was, I'm like, dude, let's just do a 3D scan. It would be so much faster than all of this ridiculousness. Because here's the thing, training your eye, it works all the time. No matter <laughs> what you're trying, blanket, magical skill. You can always use it. But why, Kat, do people want to go for the measurements over training your eye? Maybe that's a very utilitarian approach. I don't know. When I think about measuring things and having one answer, one correct answer for every question you're going to get, it almost reminds me of the American education system, <laughs> which honestly, it that's not helpful in real life to be tested on something and say there's only one right answer that's possible. That's just not realistic. What is realistic is to be able to ex to prepare for different scenarios. And that is what training your eye does for different contexts of drawing. Also, if you're life drawing a jet lagged Lauren in China, <laughs> I am not thinking about measuring. You know why? At a certain point, your subject wakes up. And you're like, shoot, I can't work on it anymore. And so I just am like drawing furiously because she's jet lagged and she did wake up eventually. But I would not want to measure in that situation because measuring is time consuming. Ginger says, I'm kind of surprised by this because when I first started learning, I just got told to measure all the time. I got told and I just didn't listen. How about you, Kat? <laughs> Same thing, because you know what? Measuring takes up so much time and also measure compared to what? The body is not several feet tall all the time. Uh, when I look at something from far away, it might seem like a few inches tall. So I don't know what unit of measurement I'm even supposed to use when measuring. Why not just train your eye and just compare and contrast that way? So Sonnet says, I don't think I've ever measured things when drawing the figure. Lisa says, surprised by this, because when I first started learning, I just got told to measure all, oh wait, sorry, that's Ginger. <laughs> Lisa <laughs> says, I consider lining up things or comparing as a type of measuring. Yeah, there's different degrees of measuring. Certainly there's the calipers, and then there's literal inches and in proportions, do the math. And I feel like I measure with my eye, like Kat, I, I make the comparisons, but there's no numbers involved. So I'd like to know who here has had to do numbers or however. Kathy says, I've never actually measured anything, but do compare sometimes, especially to diagnose when something that doesn't look quite right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so why is training your eyes so much faster, Kat? 
Because again, it works in all contexts. And I think when you train your eye, you're able to sum up generalities first and then eventually go into details. I think when you measure, you get too detailed too fast. You're worried about exact proportions of little things when really you should look at the figure in context. I mean, you can literally see the figure in context. So why not draw that down? <laughs> I don't know about anyone else. This hurts my head. I can't even look at this. Now, I mean to mention that why are all the nude women in all these drawing books, why do they all have high heels? Why? How is this necessary? I need some explanation on this. <laughs> By the way, all the men wrote these books. <laughs> um, male gaze. Male gaze, yep. I, I mean, do people find this comforting, Kat? Maybe somebody with a different kind of brain than me. <laughs> I feel like drawing might be such a weird idea to some people where they say, okay, well, I don't understand drawing, but I do understand numbers. And so I'm going to go off of that. That might be some people's coping skill to maybe start drawing. But once you start to actually understand drawing, you realize there is no simple answer to it. You have to be able to look and recognize and honor the differences from person to person. And your eye, it works when you're drawing landscapes. It works when you're painting a still life. That is a skill that transfers between images that's going to serve you extremely well. Because here's the thing. If you're measuring, let's talk numbers, okay? You say, oh, the arm, they taught me this in grad school, is one and three quarters of a head long. And we had to do the math for real with calipers and also with dividers. But the thing is, if I'm thinking one and three quarters, am I really looking? No, you're making an assumption. <laughs> so this is what I do. If I'm drawing the figure, I'll say, okay, how wide is the head compared to the breast? I don't say, oh, the breast, it has to be 1.253 heads wide. And so what I'm doing, as you can see in these bars, I say, oh, when I look at those two together, the head is much wider than the breast. Mm. And how long does it take to do that? Just like that. <laughs> or I, I oftentimes compare height, which shoulder mm. is higher than the other. And it's so often I'll go to a student and I'll ask them that question. And they say, oh, it's the one on the left. And I say, well, look at yours. They're lined up. And so I think this is much more practical than all those numbers and fractions. Mm -hmm. Louisa says, I'm a dressmaker and that trained my eye without realizing. My drawn figures have gotten so much better in proportions, I think, because I'm constantly eyeballing body measurements down to inches. Oh, that's fantastic. Don't you love that? Wow, Louisa has a really keen eye then. That's excellent. So this is probably one of the most common proportion systems that I see people using out there. And again, thank you, Loomis, for giving us a picture of what the ideal proportions are for a male. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> So let's do some measuring. Will eight heads tall work for Michael Jordan? Why do you think I picked Michael Jordan as opposed to average person? Michael Jordan, isn't he insanely tall? He's a basketball player. You think about all the different ways people live depending on their profession or their circumstance and people's bodies are so different from each other. So if we look mm. at Michael Jordan, Okay, there we go. We've got a head. <laughs> Let's see how many heads Michael Jordan is. Seven and a half heads tall. I was surprised. I thought he was going to be like 10. 10 heads. <laughs> <laughs> so he's seven heads. Hmm. And what about Michelangelo? Now, some people might say, oh, but this is a drawing. And it's, it's a drawing for a mural. It's not a life drawing class. Does this still count for us to look at this? Sure, why not? It's one of the greats. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so one head is that big. 
and we have all the heads, 11 heads tall. Now, what does that tell you about Michelangelo's grasp of proportion on the figure? That he's eyeballing it probably. I think that another thing that's worth mentioning here though, is that head is definitely foreshortened. It's not yep. looking straight at the viewer, it's looking up and therefore the head seems smaller because it is foreshortened. And so it is not fair to measure this figure based on the head that we do see. So why even measure with heads in the first place? <laughs> well, the other thing too, is if you think about a figure drawing, okay, there are many components, the marks you make, the gesture, the movement, your value range. All those things are a big package that creates our drawing. And if you put measuring at the very top, guess what falls away? If measuring is the number one priority, do you think you're gonna lose in terms of gesture or value? Of course. And I think that you would lose a lot of expression in your drawing as well. Thank you so much, Jay King, who says can't stay, just wanted to pop in and show some support. Well, thank you so much, Jay King. <laughs> so great to have that. And we have also Louisa saying Simone Biles, who is 4'8", is also seven heads proportion. And Seven Angelic says relation proportion is good, but getting out rulers and exact numbers feels like something for an architect or engineering, not a portrait. I mean, what we do is not an exact science. <laughs> that might actually be really frustrating for people. Some people really want exact measurements, but I think that being in the arts, you also have to make yourself available for opportunity and potential in other ways, other ways than just measuring with numbers. So let's see. If it works on Aaron to bait, <laughs> let's see if he is eight heads tall. You know, I just need to know. It's just okay. people need more examples, you know? Okay, so let's see. There's his head. And this one's also foreshortened on the head. So doesn't that create problems? Yeah. So what but I did, <laughs> I just made it, you know, it's a little bit too long, but whatever. Let's just try it. Let's see if he's eight heads tall. Seven and a half heads tall. Hmm. Tall man. I won't elaborate. <laughs> okay, now this is, to me, the most compelling reason to not measure. It, just, it does not account for a range of body types. I mean, if you look at Loomis, it's so out of date. It's like, oh, white women that are skinny, I guess that's all the women in the world. But it's like, mm. you can't even conceive of how many body types exist in the world. I agree. I also think that a lot of people when they are drawing tend to draw what they see in media. And very often we see very similar body types portrayed in media because that is what is desired. But if people look beyond media and the world around them at themselves, at just everybody in context, you would realize that there are so many varieties of body types out there. The other thing too is when I've seen people measure, they're doing it for every drawing. Okay, so regardless mm. of who the model is, it's the exact same measuring system. So if you're using eight heads, whether you're drawing Ken or Linda, the two RISD models I've worked with, you're still gonna do eight heads and you're gonna try to get Ken's body to fit into the eight heads, which you know something makes everybody generic. I mean, I can't imagine that you get anybody's unique qualities if it's the exact same proportion system. That almost feels like a cookie cutter version of like how to measure out a body. And again, that's impossible. And isn't it a problem for foreshortening? <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah, when, when the instant you have foreshortening, measuring just totally goes out the window. Everything you understand goes out the window because foreshortened poses just look weird. They look weird no matter what. They are not in proportion. At that point, you have to use your eye. There's a, it's impossible to measure this. And I know foreshortening is difficult, but really your eye is the only tool you've got when it comes to foreshortening. And the thing is, what I've seen is people come so much to rely on measuring 
that they are not training their eye. And so basically you have an eye that is not trained to the degree that it should be. And so I could argue that measuring the figure is you not taking care of your eye from an artist's point of view. Does that work? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was deep, Clara. You have to take care of yourself. You have to train your eye too. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think anyone can argue that your eye is a critical part of being an artist for the most part. I mean, not Absolutely. necessarily for, I don't know, every context, but it's pretty important. And I think no matter what you're doing, you're an installation artist, you're an architect, whatever field, you are looking at things. An architect mm -hmm. may look at something differently than me, but it's about training your eye. And don't you think that's different than just saying, oh yeah, I looked at it. Because when you train your eye, you look at things with intention and you look at things therefore in a more profound manner because intention and um, effort are there. Whereas if you're just going to look at anything, well then, that's what anybody could do, really. Anybody who can see can do. So what makes your vision so special? What makes what you see so special? Well, Kat, I'm curious, when you draw the figure, what percentage of the process for you do you think is looking and what percentage is the actual physical movement with your hand? I think looking makes up, well, if I had to give a number to it, it could probably... <laughs> probably like 70% because, oh my gosh, I'm teaching figure drawing currently during the summer, like in class, brick and mortar classroom. And I was surprised how many people were just making it up. And I can tell they're making it up. How? Their drawing boards block their view of the figure. I'm like, mm -hmm. change your drawing boards, see the figure, draw what you see. And so actually being able to look carefully and to look well is a skill that you have to develop even down to where do you place your drawing board actually you know how i can tell is i'll just stand in the middle of the room where the model is okay and i'm not looking at anyone's drawing and i'm just looking at them i just Ooh. look at their faces and this is what you get <laughs> like this and it's like i'll see students and they won't look up for like five minutes I mean, could you picture if I said, Kat, you can't look at the fig, you get one glance, and now you can't look at it for five minutes. Like, how would that make you feel? <laughs> I would feel blindsided, literally and figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so people make the assumption that, oh, your hand, that is the whole thing. I'm like, no way. That is absolutely less than the eye and what the eye is sending to your hand. Mm -hmm. Janice says, you know, it may be a way of making art fit along other academic subjects, taking notes, things to study. What do you think about that? I think this actually harkens back to something I said earlier, where I felt like measuring the figure to me had the same energy as the American education system in terms of it has to be all in place. It all has to have one answer. And it just is a way that people make it fit exactly how Janice said. And that's just not going to be the case. Disrupt people's expectations. Be a good artist and train your eye. <laughs> exactly. And the thing is, people will say, oh, but if I learn the eight head proportion system, then I can apply it to everyone. I'm like, no, the eight head proportions. So that's not the same thing as training your eye. It's two separate skills. Just because mm -hmm. you have the measuring skill doesn't mean you have the eye skill. In fact, it's probably a guarantee that that happens. Yeah. Like Lisa's saying, I've noticed artists who lean on Loomis create generic figures. Yeah. Cause they look like robots, <laughs> all those drawings in his books. Anna says, I only paint differently abled and fat people, and none of these systems measure a non-normative body with any accuracy. They certainly can't capture the spirit. I mean, those people don't exist in those drawing books. And mm -hmm. it's very frustrating if you don't want to paint, I don't know, size two white women, which is what the entire books are about. And then what about this cat? The second the figure doesn't stand up, what happens with measuring? 
again, it goes out the window. It's totally useless in this case, because not only do you have a figure that is bent probably all sorts of ways, but body parts layer, body parts come out at you and body parts go away from you. Things are foreshortened, things are in movement. How are you supposed to measure all of those moving limbs? You can't just look at it. <laughs> well, the other thing about measuring is what we're getting at. It works in one really specific context. Mm -hmm. Standing figure has to be a long pose, and that's it. If you take away any of that, short pose, person who's not size two, white female, none of those things work. And so it's like, why would you want to learn a skill that only works, what, 1% of the time? I, I just don't see the rationale behind that. It's a very um useless tool it is and totally unrelated to all the other stuff so we have a question from mukan doggy sorry i don't know how to say your name but don't the heels referring to the drawings and loomis of the women that are wearing high heels don't the heels make the muscle more defined well i would say if we want to have the muscles be more defined then maybe the men in the figure drawings should wear heels as well if we want to see those defined forms. So I just don't understand why the women have to wear heels, but the men don't. It just doesn't work for me, sorry. <laughs> mm. I will also say normally in real life, uh, nobody's flexing their calf muscles all the time anyways. That's just not how people work. There are people who walk barefoot. There are people who wear sneakers. Why not draw people in all contexts? Sure, draw women in high heels, draw men in high heels, but also draw people in sneakers and barefoot. And Dana says, I have a hard time sighting. I don't know if you mean specifically, is it sightseeing? Is that the phrase, Kat? I can't remember. I have a hard time sightseeing. Maybe I have a hard time seeing. Hmm. Well, Dana, yeah. if you want to maybe clarify a little bit, we can certainly answer your question. But if you're talking about seeing, having trouble doing that, one thing that really helps me with training my eye is squinting. Do you squint, Kat? Oh, I squint all the time. That helps me see the big forms of whatever is in front of me, as well as see the big shapes of light and shadow. Well, think about it this way. Most people are distracted by details. They'll say, oh, look at those eyelashes. But you can't do that when you're trying to capture the whole figure. And so if you squint, you won't see eyelashes. You're going to see the big shapes, which oddly enough are hard to see if you're <laughs> looking at everything in focus, because we do get distracted by that stuff. So if you guys watch our videos, I'm always like, <laughs> to, like making some like super grouchy face it, it's a skill you have to train yourself because cat i don't think that's something you learn overnight no you really have to do it with intention because i think it's also about breaking bad habits from before when you look you just look and you don't think much beyond that but to see seeing is something that you have to take a lot of time and effort to do specifically and you got to practice. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the best way to train your eye is to draw from life. Photos are helpful. I understand they're convenient. I use them all the time. But training your eye, if you do that from life, it's going to happen so much faster than with a photo. Why do you think that is, Kat? Because I think you're forced to come to terms with the fact that things are moving. You have to get things down fast. And therefore, you get the good process of drawing the general forms first and then eventually going into something more detailed. Also, there's just something much more lively about drawing from life. When it comes to a photo, it warps that perception just a little bit. I'm sure that your camera lens changes something a little bit. Maybe it's like the lens itself will warp it a bit. It flattens it out. It, uh, what was it? It whitewashes like the light it becomes like super dark and contrasted and you can't see the nuances of how color and light and shadow travel across surfaces. And so when you are drawing from life, your eye is the perceiving thing. Whereas if you're drawing from a photo, it's really the camera lens that is perceiving that subject. 
Tell us in the chat, who here draws from life? Maybe you draw from life in a specific context. For me, it's usually plain air because I feel ridiculous taking a photo of a landscape and then going home and painting it. And for other people, it's life drawing sometimes. But I'd like to know because actually, I think Google Images has caused many people to just skip over drawing from life because mm. the photographs are just so easy to get. I mean, when I was a kid, you had to go to the library and like Xerox a picture <laughs> out of a magazine. <laughs> it was in the collection. We couldn't just click on things. <laughs> but fundamentally, this to me is the most important difference is that when people measure drawings, and I'm talking again about numbers and calipers and things, they're stiff. They are so stiff. I agree because I think it almost... It loses so much life when you measure it out. It's like almost a mannequin at that point, like exactly this head, exactly this torso. And it's supposed to be bent specifically like this. It's almost like you're manipulating a puppet and you're not actually trying to honor a real life person. I'm sorry, Loomis. <laughs> I'm not a fan. <laughs> I mean, look at the guy on the right. First of all, <laughs> what are you but isn't the weight distribution on the legs really awkward and stiff? It really is. What even is he doing? Is he trying to fight someone or is he hiding from someone? This gesture, I don't understand the story behind it. <laughs> I mean, look at the back. I mean, doesn't he look like he's like doing this? Like... I don't know, like it's just really strange looking. And even the figure on the left, which doesn't have the weird weight distribution. I, I mean, his neck is so like uncomfortably, weirdly straight. Like these drawings don't feel naturalistic to me. Do they to you? They feel like somebody was posing there for a photo. It doesn't feel like a real person living life. It feels too curated. Because I think ultimately, even if we are drawing a life model and a drawing context where somebody is posing, you can still do a lot with it. I really try to see the model as individual. So I'm drawing Ken. It's not, oh, I'm drawing a man. I'm drawing Ken. What is specific about Ken that is mm -hmm. not the same from all the other male models that I know? And that can happen with a model you've never worked with before new model comes in, I can still say, well, what is it about him that makes him distinctive? Because Kat, I think people forget that in the life drawing situation. That is sad to think about. Yes. I think a lot of people when they're figure drawing are thinking, okay, I need to draw the body as accurately as possible, but they forget that the figure model is a person with a name and a story with specificities about them. And I think it's really important that whenever you do do figure modeling, I uh, sorry, draw from figure models, who knows, maybe it could be a figure model too. I think that's the fastest yeah. way to understand what a figure model would feel like. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when you are drawing from a figure model, recognize what makes them an individual, recognize what makes them special and honor that in your drawing. So why do you think these drawings aren't stiff? These are by Jenny Seville. They touch each other. They touch each other quite naturally as well. And they layer on top of each other. They're almost like this big pile of flesh, one on top of the other. I don't think that you can draw that. I really think that you have to either observe, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think you can measure that. In order to draw that, you would need to observe it. And I think you would also need to feel for it too. Like how are the relationships between these people, how would they react to each other naturally? I will say a lot of the times, because I went to this local drawing group a um, couple weeks back, and there was one person I talked to, and he asked me for help. And I said, well, what's really your priority here? What is the thing you're really trying to focus on? He said, I want to be correct. And I was like, there's other things. Like, <laughs> like, is that really the only thing? And then people will say, oh, but you're practicing. I'm not a contemporary artist showing in a gallery like Jenny Seville. Therefore, it's different. I'm like, so what? You're going to wait until you're a gallery artist to be expressive? You're going to mm -hmm. wait that long? I, I just don't think this whole draw it correct and then I'll be expressive. It just doesn't work that way. 
again, I think that people want to boil it down to say, oh, step one, be correct. Step two, express myself. It's almost the same mindset around measuring in the first place. There's no simple answer to this. You really have to find a way to try multiple things at once and try uh, finding the thing that works the best for you. I read an article in the New York Times today, guess what? It was about how social media algorithms do not encourage curiosity or people to discover things for themselves. And this is the same thing. It's like, do you really want a template that somebody hands to you that says, yep, we're all eight heads tall? Or would you like to just go out there and see, oh, yeah, many more people exist than eight heads tall, like Aaron Tavane and Michael Jordan. So these are all <laughs> things we need to think about. So with measuring, it's a skill that I just feel like it's such a waste of time. And it's such a tangent to the skills that really matter. Guess what, everybody? We're having a Discord stage session. Please meet us in the post live streams stage channel right after the stream. You can sponsor a video. You know something? The video we had on Sunday, the Read and Wire Sculpture Stream, this happened because of a generous sponsor in our community. And we are so grateful for that support. So when you sponsor a video, you're not just getting it made because maybe you want to see it, but the whole community benefits. So it's a wonderful way to give back to our global community. The information is in the YouTube video description below. Visit ourprof.org. There's so much content on there that is not on YouTube. Use the search bar. Join our Patreon group. We've got weekly voice sessions with staff, critiques from me that are like little research papers, and you get support in a small group of artists. There is also no three to one critique rule that we have in the public channels. So share your art with us, get the critiques, and this is the best small group so you don't get lost in the shuffle. Art Prof has services. We have artist calls, personal art curriculum, statement editing, portfolio critiques. Thank you to our wonderful top Patreon supporters who keep the lights on, make it possible for us to stay up and running. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And subscribe to our channel for more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.